At California Lutheran College, the training camp of the Dallas Cowboys, Tom Landry faced a critical year. He no longer had the luxury of manning each position with veterans. So the question was how to blend the old and new Cowboys into a championship team. They're chargers now. They don't mess around. They come. Make them block you. Right over the top of them. Head on. Take off right through that gap. Let's go. Go hard. Go hard. Go hard. OK, that's the way to find daylight. That's the way to find daylight. OK, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. 323. 323. Red dog fast, OK? Hot. Hot. That right away, okay. That's the boy. That's the way to go. Okay, that's the way to go. That's Tatum. You, you better be ready. I tell you, when you go through there, if you get through there, you better holler, Tatum, because he's gonna come. When training camp ended and the new season dawned, many observers had relegated the Cowboys to third place in the NFC's Eastern Division. Even in the minds of the players themselves. The delicate balance of youth and age, budding talent and seasoned veterans, was still unresolved. 1973 would be a year of something old, something new for the Dallas Cowboys. Laced with a rich vein of raw talent, Tom Landry's Cowboys met the Chicago Bears in the season's first week. Mistakes told the tale of the game, and Dallas reaped a harvest of Chicago turnovers. Generaled by Roger Starbuck, the Cowboys' offense unfurled something old and something new. The new was wide receiver Otto Stowe. The old was tried and true Bob Hayes, as Dallas edged Chicago 20 to 17. After losing just one preseason game, were the Bears faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive? That is the question optimistic Chicago fans wanted answered. Unhappily, on opening day, the mascot seemed to throw better spirals than Bear quarterback Bobby Douglas. While the passing offense proved non-existent, there was room for improvement on ball handling finesse. Six times, Bear backs fumbled, so Bobby Douglas took matters into his own hand. And once Big Bobby hits his stride, linebacker's knees begin to wobble. While Douglas is a punishing runner, Cowboy quarterback Roger Staubach is not. Escape, not collision, is his trademark. The Bears' trademark is stringing you out on an iron-armed clothesline. History teaches us that we can learn from our past mistakes. Roger learned that the closest distance between two points is not necessarily a straight line. Setback Calvin Hill carried 31 bone-wearying times for 130 yards, and it appeared he too needed a compass to locate the right direction. With the scores tied at three, Staubach decided to end this nonsense, so he lobbed a scoring shot to new cowboy Otto Stowe, number 82. The lead ballooned to 17-3 when Roger connected with Bob Hayes, who last season failed to catch a single touchdown pass. The diehard Bears rallied when Ike Hill returned Marv Bateman's punt 59 yards.
On the first play of the final quarter, Carl Garrett squirted through Dallas to tie the game at 17. With six minutes left, the Bears gambled on fourth and one and lost. The fake punt did not fool Dallas rookie Billy Joe Dupree, number 89. Dupree's play was converted into a Tony Frisch field goal, and Dallas won 20-17. On Monday night, Dallas buried New Orleans under a barrage of touchdowns. Mike Montgomery and Robert Newhouse, two second-year Cowboys, spurred the 40-3 route of the Saints. At Texas Stadium, the unbeaten and underdog St. Louis Cardinals face the undefeated Dallas Cowboys. Under Don Coriel, the Cardinals have become a wide-open, explosive, offensive team. They have a strong-arm quarterback in Jim Hart and two quicksilver receivers in Mel Gray, number 85, and rookie running back Terry Metcalf, number 21. However, against the Doomsday defense, St. Louis scored but one touchdown. It came in the last quarter when number 27, Eddie Moss, carried out a beautiful fake, and Donnie Anderson powered over for his seventh touchdown of the young season. For most of the day, Dallas completely disrupted the big red attack. They held St. Louis to 51 yards rushing, and led by the outside charge of Larry Cole, number 63, they collapsed the Cardinal pass pocket. Twice, Doomsday intercepted Jim Hart. Here, a blitz by number 50, D.D. Lewis, and fine outside coverage of 84, Walker Gillette, resulted in a Cliff Harris interception. On offense, Roger Staubach was superb, and Bob Hayes was a blur in the Cardinal secondary. Misdirection by the Cowboys had the Cardinals flowing one way, and Roger threw back against the grain for a touchdown to Billy Joe Dupree. The second touchdown resulted from letter-perfect execution of the sweep by the offensive line and set back Calvin Hill. All day, Staubach lured the defense in, then deftly dumped the ball to chunky Robert Newhouse. At the end of the third quarter, Staubach on a rollout connected with Dupree again, and Dallas had 31 points. When Staubach rested, the Dallas machine purred along smoothly as Craig Morton hit rookie Golden Richards dead in stride with a 53-yard touchdown. By days in, the Cowboys amassed almost 600 yards on offense, scored six touchdowns, three by Billy Joe Dupree, and earned a convincing 45-10 victory over the Cardinals. Against St. Louis in the third week, the Cowboys rode to victory behind the blocking of John Fitzgerald, Blaine Nye, John Nylon, Rodney Wallace, Ralph Neely, and Rayfield Wright. The new man on this young but veteran offensive line was rookie tight end Billy Joe Dupree, who caught three touchdown passes against the Cardinals. Dallas overwhelmed St. Louis 45 to 10. And after three games, the delicate balance of youth and age melded into three sweet victories. On Monday night, 
the first place cowboys went head to head with their bitter rivals, the Washington Redskins. It was toe to toe in the trenches as Doomsday howled in on blitzes and bulldozed Sonny Jurgensen. The front line of Bill Gregory, Pat Toomey, Larry Cole, Jethro Pugh, and Bob Lilly caved in Sonny's pocket, while Cornell Green, Mel Renfro, Charlie Waters, and Cliff Harris swarmed in from the secondary. Linebackers D.D. Lewis, Dave Edwards, Leroy Jordan, and rookie Rodrigo Barnes pinched in the middle. The doomsday defense, every man a hitter. It was a brutal, bruising, scoreless game until some Starbuck passes and roughhouse runs bit deep into the Burgundy. On two well-aimed passes to sure-handed Otto Stoll, Dallas gained a hard-earned seven-to-nothing lead. In the final 30 minutes, Washington tied the score. And with the game up for grabs, the Redskins snatched it away from Dallas. The defeat was a bitter one. Losing after almost certain victory had a sour after effect, as in week number five, Dallas came up flat against the undefeated Ram. Ram head coach Chuck Knox has the looks befitting a matinee idol. What's more, he has a superb cast complete with stars and supporting players. The result is that the Los Angeles Rams are the top entertainment attraction in Southern California. And once again, after a two-year hiatus, the Los Angeles Coliseum is the place to be on Sunday afternoons. The unbeaten Rams already have a two-game lead over their arch rival to the north, San Francisco. What's more, they have a plethora of statistics to support their lofty status. They have the best running attack in the National Conference. Larry McCutcheon and Jim Bertelson rank second and fifth, respectively. This has given them exceptional ball control, and John Hadel has thrown sparingly. He's a leading passer in the NFC by far and has completed over 73% of his throws. In fact, the Rams have been so successful at controlling the ball with Hadel, McCutcheon, and Bertelson operating behind football's most experienced offensive line that the team has averaged merely three punts per game, an amazingly low number. Despite all the activity outside the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum on a beautiful 90-degree day last Sunday, the main focus was inside the stadium where the Rams met the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas coming off a defeat at the hands of the Redskins was determined to win to keep pace with Washington. Their task was a difficult one for the Rams are revamped in every phase. New owner, new coach, new quarterback, and new uniforms. The philosophy isn't new or it's a winning one. And so far in 1973, the Rams have yet to know defeat. This is the NFL Game of the Week. The Los Angeles Rams versus the Dallas Cowboys. Liner was picked off by Mel Renfro on the Ram 30. Dallas narrowed the gap to seven, 14 to seven. Down by two touchdowns, the Dallas offense, so far held scoreless, finally came to life on the first series of the second quarter. Disdaining the run, Staubach went to Otto Stowe on two consecutive plays that covered 17 yards each. Watching the graceful, talented Stowe, who played in the shadow of Paul Warfield, it makes one wonder how the Miami Dolphins let him get away. After an interference penalty put the ball in Ram land, Staubach hit Stowe for the third straight time, this one for 26 yards on the eighth. <laughs> on 
on one of the few successful running plays in this entire ball game, Calvin Hill circled left end for the touchdown that brought the Cowboys to within seven points, 21-14. Rams on with a pass to Billy Joe Dupree. Another look at Dupree's reception reveals why the Cowboys are so pleased with their number one draft choice. At 6'4", 230 pounds, the fleet rookie from Michigan State gives Dallas their first game-breaking tight end. On two plays, Staubach worked over the right side of the Rams. First, he hit Otto Stowe with a square out. Then he ran a sweep with Hill tucked snug behind guards Blaine Nye and John Nyland. Switching the attack to the other side, Calvin Hill followed his matched pair of pulling guards to another Dallas first down. his abilities and on the very next play Roger rifled a touchdown to him between two defenders. Stowe's brilliant catch narrowed the Rams lead to 34-21 and it was up to the doomsday defense to summon up their old blood and thunder. Doomsday rose up and crunched the Rams Jim Bertelson. It was euphoric to the lone cowboy fan who was but a needle in a forest of ram backers. Back on the attack, Staubach spurred the cowboy comeback onward with a screen pass to Hill. The success of the last play resulted from a block from Rodney Wallace, number 71. Wallace replaced injured all-pro tackle Rayfield Wright in the second half and consistently provided a sturdy convoy for Dallas's setbacks. Mike Montgomery launched a shot to the sun and blinded by the glare, Jim Bertelson fumbled the fair catch and the Cowboys' Jim Arneson recovered on the Rams' 23. Dallas had 15 minutes to turn the game around, and so the combined Cowboy Brain Trust searched for a ray of hope, a brainstorm that would burst into a needed touchdown. On a flanker reverse, number 71 Rodney Wallace screened out the defensive end, and Otto Stowe scooted behind number 61 Blaine Nye. An all-out blitz left Stowe with the man-to-man -man coverage of Ram rookie Sweet Eddie McMillan. Stowe soured Sweet Eddie, and with 13 minutes remaining, Dallas trailed Los Angeles 37-28. Hadel protected his nine-point cushion with a routine square out to Jack Snow, but Charlie Waters snaked through with a sparkling interception. Waters' return not only set Dallas up nicely at the Ram 24, but it momentarily cleansed the tarnished skills of the young cornerback, who so often had been the fall guy of Ram strategy. With 12 minutes left, another Ram blitz freed Calvin Hill, who powered to the 10-yard line. Watch the false flow of left guard John Nyla, number 76, who took one false step to the right, then peeled back to lead Dupree on a tight end around. Inside the five, the Rams towed out, and even Walt Garrison's determined charge on third down could not dent the end zone. So 
So on fourth down, with nine and one half minutes remaining, Tony Fritch kicked Dallas to within a touchdown at 37-31. With exactly five minutes left, Dallas reclaimed the ball, and on a reverse screen pass, Hill exploded to the Cowboys' 35. Number 73, Ralph Neely drove Fred Dreyer out of Staubach's pocket, but with all receivers blanketed, Roger was forced to flee. Staubach's 10-yard scramble gave Dallas a first down at their 45, but two incomplete passes brought up a third down with less than three minutes remaining. Behind failed safe protection, Rogers stepped up and threw right into the hands of defensive back Al Clark, number 44. Bogged down with a lackluster 1-3-1 and one record, Alex Webster's Giants hope to salvage their season against powerful Dallas. But it was not to be, as the Cowboys' rushing legions were unstoppable. Walt Garrison started his first game of 1973 and gained nearly 80 yards, while Calvin Hill, the NFC's leading rusher, amassed nearly 160 yards running and receiving. The Cowboys' first score resulted from perfect execution. Watch middle linebacker Jim Files move with Walt Garrison. With the middle vacated, guard Blaine Nye, number 61, blew out Dan Goish, and Hill burst in for six points. But New York hung tough and tied the game on a Norm Sneed connection with Bob Tucker. The Giants drove for the lead, but Larry Cole, number 63, ripped in on Norm Sneed. Cole's fumble recovery led directly to a garrison touchdown, and Dallas led 17-7 at the half. Early in the third quarter, Sneed hooked up with Bob Grimm, and the lead was shaved to three points, 17-14. Then the doomsday defense went to work. Their defensive ends pinched in and punched out Norm Sneed. Then good fortune beckoned when a high snap to Jim McCann was converted into a block punt by Billy Joe Dupree. Dupree's block triggered a one-man show by the rookie tight end from Michigan State. With Dallas leading 31 to 14, Dupree cashed in on a tight end screen. Dupree's touchdown made the score 38 to 14, and Doomsday bolted down victory number four. Leroy Jordan's hit on Ron Johnson brought up another McCann punt, another Dupree block, and a touchdown for D.D. Lewis number 50. Another angle shows that Dupree boiled in clean, then extended himself over blocker Jim Files to reject McCann's punt. Lewis's touchdown salted away the victory, but the New York Giants refused to quit. Back after a one-week sabbatical, Randy Johnson proved he was true blue by throwing two touchdown passes. The heroics were too little, too late, as Dallas won 45 to 28. Remained just one game off the pace of the Washington Redskins in the NFC East. With a three and two record, the dreams of a title were foundering. But in the sixth week, Tom Landry's resourceful team got well against the New York Giants. A blocked punt by rookie Billy Joe Dupree was recovered by D.D. Lewis for a touchdown and keynoted victory. 
All year long, Dupree had been a devastating force on special teams. But in the complex scheme of the Cowboy offense, his special talents made him a big play receiver. Although Dallas blistered past the Giants, 45 to 28, the root of the Cowboys' problems was inconsistency. And this was never more evident than in their seventh game with the rebuilt Eagles. Philadelphia sent the Cowboys tumbling to their third defeat, and the future looked bleak indeed. Dallas cut the lead to 10-6 on a Roger Staubach floater to Otto Stowe. But Dallas fell behind 20 to 6, and so Staubach looked exclusively to Stowe, and the big play receiver personally led the Cowboys to another score. Stowe's second touchdown catch made the score 20 to 13. The D in Dallas meant defense this week, and Doomsday dropped in frequently on Ken Anderson. By far the most intimidating Dallas defender was linebacker Leroy Jordan, number 55, who ranged from sideline to sideline, smacking Bengal runners. Jordan scored the first Cowboy touchdown when he intercepted Anderson's pass and raced 31 yards to give Dallas a 10-0 lead. In the first quarter, Jordan intercepted passes on three consecutive Cincinnati series to set up an early route of the Bengals. When Roger Staubach caught bullet Bob Hayes on the fly, Dallas built a 17-0 first quarter bulge. Staubach went to setback turned receiver Mike Montgomery in the second period. Montgomery beat the zone first to the outside and then he burned it across the middle for a touchdown. Montgomery's score gave Dallas a commanding 24-0 halftime pad. But in the third quarter, a field goal and a 50-yard Anderson bomb to rookie Isaac Curtis cut the lead to 14 points. The Doomsday defense cemented on their helmets and 190-pound cornerback Charlie Waters stuck it to 245-pound running back Booby Clark. Doomsday was rarely fooled. Watch number 52, Dave Edwards, and number 75, Jethro Pugh, move to the screen back. Without a receiver, Anderson was an easy feast for Larry Cole. Dallas rolled to a 31-10 advantage when Bronco-busting Walt Garrison rodeoed in for six. Perfect defensive play put the finishing touch on the Cincinnati Bengals. A blistering outside charge by number 67, Pat Tume, combined with a hard hit by Mel Renfro, gave defensive tackle Jethro Pugh a chance to showcase his moves. Pugh's run was converted into a Staubach to Billy Joe Dupree connection in the end zone as the Dallas Cowboys spiked the Cincinnati Bengals 38-10. With a sizzling offense and a sputtering defense, the Dallas Cowboys ended the final seven games with a cloudy future. But if there was a glimmer of hope for the Cowboys and their fans, it was the knowledge that at the midpoint of 1971, 
the year they won the Super Bowl, their record stood the same at four and three. Against Cincinnati, the special teams led by Marv Bateman, Dave Manders, and Benny Barnes girded their strength and blew out the lean and hungry Bengals. The Cowboys flew past the stunned Bengals as Roger Starbuck studied the defense with a jeweler's eye, then surgically dissected it. Dallas dispatched the Bengals 38 to 10. It was a festive afternoon for football at the Yale Bowl, and the much maligned New York Giants defense made Roger Staubach the feast for their homecoming. It was also homecoming for former Yaley Calvin Hill, and although he did not tear up the old sod, Calvin rushed for nearly 100 tough yards. For the second straight Sunday, the doomsday defense was simply devastating. Quarterback Randy Johnson's main tormentor was cornerback Charlie Waters, number 41, who intercepted two passes. The Cowboys burst to a 13-0 lead on two field goals and a six-pointer by Walt Garrison, who snatched a touchdown from his shoot tops. New York rallied on Johnson's long-distance bombing and some nifty receiving by Bob Grimm, who looked the ball into his sure hands. A field goal and Ron Johnson's short pop narrowed the score to 13-10 at halftime. In the final two quarters, giant victory drives often fell fingertips away from touchdowns. But be it a bomb or a bit of trickery, no giant ruse could stay the Dallas diehards. And the Cowboys emerged victors 23 to 10. For the Giants, the loss was their swan song in this long and disappointing season. And then at the Yale Bowl, the Cowboys raced past the Giants 23 to 10. Right from the start, the Eagles' defense made mincemeat of the highest scoring team in the NFL. And on the first possession of the second quarter, quarterback Roman Gabriel found Charles Young in the seam of the Dallas zone. The Rookie of the Year candidate blazed 80 yards to give Philadelphia a stunning 10-0 lead. But minutes later, the Eagles' optimism and morale wilted when Roman left the game after his right arm collided with Jethro Pugh's helmet. With Gabriel absent, the Cowboys blew out the Eagles on the sure hands and flying feet of Walt Garrison, number 32. On the day, Garrison rushed for almost 90 yards of the club record 286 that Dallas churned out against Philadelphia. After a nifty play action fake, Roger Staubach connected with Garrison and Dallas led 14-10. The Eagles seemed back in the game when linebacker John Sadaski intercepted a Staubach pass. But Sadaski's lateral to Marlon McKeever was re-stolen by Billy Joe Dupree. Given that break, Dallas decimated the Eagles. 
On a delay pattern, Staubach hit Bob Hayes streaking against the grain. At the goal line, rookie safety Randy Logan met Hayes one on one and lost. Trailing 21-10, John Reed stood in for Gabriel and attempted a short passing attack. His shortest pass traveled but three yards and nestled into the surprised hands of defensive end Pat Toomey. The Cowboys salted the game away on a 54-yard burst by Robert Newhouse. Tucked snugly behind all-pro guard John Nyland, number 76, Newhouse rambled to the one-inch line. Walt Garrison's second touchdown rounded out the revenge match as Dallas won handily, 31-10. Back home at Texas Stadium, they gained revenge and their third straight victory as they beat Philadelphia 31 to 10. Dallas was in cruising gear and the tidal wave seemed to be cresting until it was dashed by the world champion Dolphins. Miami surged to a fast two touchdown lead and held on to win 14 to seven. On defense, Doomsday strung Mercury Morris out on a clothesline and then hung him on it to dry. The Dallas offense was dead until wide receiver Drew Pearson scooped up teammate Walt Garrison's fumble like a shortstop. The highest scoring team in the pros managed the one touchdown and vengeance was Miami's 14-7. Cowboys came to Denver with little bravado, but they came with a burning intensity to win. And all these forces were brought to bear against the Broncos as Doomsday stifled Denver both short and deep. The game plan on offense was to pass, and it provided a blueprint for victory. The Hills were alive with the sound of playoff hopes, and for the Broncos, it was a first for this late into the season. But posing a threat to postseason play for Denver were the Dallas Cowboys, who would need to stay on the wild and bucking Broncos for more than eight seconds in order to continue their playoff habit. But the Dallas running attack was all but silenced as the Broncos yielded a mere 74 yards. Though Dallas had success with the pass, Roger Staubach, unfortunately, paid for every bit of it. Staubach was dropped five times by the fired-up Denver defense, which featured hard knocks all afternoon. But unfortunately for Denver, a field goal and short pass from Charlie Johnson to Riley Odoms was the extent of their scoring punch. The Dallas defense kept the Broncos in check most of the afternoon, forcing mistakes which cost dearly in field position.
Even Floyd Little could manage but 15 yards on nine carries, as the Stallion never escaped the Cowboy Lasso. Staubach got a super catch from tight end Gene Fuga to open the Dallas scoring. Using the play action fake to offset the fearsome Denver pass rush, Staubach hit on 14 of 18 passes for an impressive 240 yards. For the final touchdown, the gutty signal caller sent the flow right, then hit Fugit going against the grain for six. The scoring hit in with number 31, Benny Barnes, dropped Bronco punter Billy Van Heusen for a safety and a 22 to 10 win. Dallas must now face the Washington Redskins for the division championship this Sunday. The afterglow of the Denver win burned through to the following Sunday when Dallas faced Washington for the Eastern Division crown. Victory and the title hinged on the doomsday defense. And in an instant replay of the previous game in Washington, doomsday ravaged the Redskins in the first half. Halftime, a Tony Fritch field goal gave Dallas a tenuous three to nothing lead. So Tom Landry decided to unveil the strategic play that ensured the Denver victory the previous week. The play was a misdirection rollout that isolated either a Dallas setback or a tight end. When the Broncos covered the setback, Starbuck went to his tight end who roamed free and embarrassingly open. Against Denver, the strategy was foolproof, but the question remained whether it would fool the experienced Redskins. The question was answered with dramatic clarity as in the final 30 minutes, Starbuck showed the Washington Redskins everything but mercy. Off play action, Starbuck rolled out and completely bewildered the Redskin defense. Starbuck cashed in on a rollout for a touchdown as Dallas won a convincing 27-7 victory and led the NFC East for the first time in eight weeks. It was not Sonny's adipose tissue that worried George Allen, but the wobbly knees that has curbed his passing mobility. So for the umpteenth straight week, George relied on his back-breaking defense. Early in the first quarter, Roger Staubach unleashed the home run to Bob Hayes. The 50-yard explosion was nullified by a holding penalty. And for most of the first half, Dallas was buried by the Burgundy. Even with maximum protection, Roger was rarely able to penetrate the well-disguised Washington defenses. Three times, the over-the-hill gang put Kurt Knight in range for three-pointers. But all three times, Knight shanked the ball, 
and at halftime, Washington trailed Dallas three to nothing. In the final two quarters, the aroused doomsday defense cancel out the Redskin offense. They limited Washington to but two first downs, and under this pressure, the Redskins spewed out the football. While Washington weakened, Staubach grew more confident, and bolstered by his pinpoint passing and nimble feet, Dallas scored the game's first touchdown. Using clever play action, Staubach rolled out and exploited the soft underbelly of the Redskins' defense. Behind the blocks of number 70 all-pro tackle Rayfield Wright, Cowboy setbacks rolled through gaping holes. Even a missed assignment failed to ruffle Rogers' cool, as Dallas was determined to win their vendetta against Washington. By game's end, Calvin Hill had rushed for over 1,000 yards on the season, and gouged out a pair of touchdowns as Dallas won 27-7 recaptured first place in the NFC. Final Sunday in St. Louis, Dallas claimed the title outright. It was a day for the young, as rookie Drew Pierce in number 88 put on a one-man show. Pearson caught five passes for 140 yards and scored his first two touchdowns of 1973. Dallas had clawed its way back to the top and entered the playoffs for a record-breaking eighth straight year. The Cowboys needed a victory over the St. Louis Cardinals to lock up the NFC's Eastern Championship for the seventh time in eight seasons. In their last ten quarters, the doomsday defense had allowed but a single touchdown. And against a spoiler team like St. Louis, they proved the dominant force. The Cardinals employed a double tight end offense for the second straight week, but Dallas linebackers, like 55 Leroy Jordan, shut down the run. Watch number 52 Dave Edwards fill on the sweep, beat down the blocker, and tackle Jim Otis hard. While Doomsday throttled Cardinal runners, the Big Red defense tried to separate Roger Staubach from his senses. A quarterback like Staubach is fair game in the open field, and the hard-pursuing Cardinals hit him hard, often, and sometimes late. However, once Rogers' protection improved, he stayed at home and threw strikes. On the day, Staubach was 14 for 19 for 252 yards. His most dependable receiver was rookie Drew Pearson, number 88, whose five receptions netted him 140 yards and two touchdowns. A 
second look at Pearson's score reveals that Dallas sent both receivers to the left. With that zone flooded, Pearson easily beats single coverage on the right side by number 26, Dwayne Crump. The Cowboys lucked into a 20-3 lead when Straubach first bumped into blocker Calvin Hill, then threw into double coverage. When number 45 Jim Tolbert slipped, Gene Fugit carried the ball and Chuck Detweiler in for six points. Dallas drove for their final touchdown using the familiar Staubach to Pearson combination. By game's end, Dallas had amassed 450 yards in offense. Pearson had racked up his second touchdown, and the Cowboys were once again champions of the NFC East. In the first Ram Cowboy encounter, Los Angeles came away with a 37-31 victory. John Hadle had led the offensive barrage as he completed 12 passes for a spectacular 279 yards. Since coming to the Rams from the Chargers, Hadle, along with wide receiver Harold Jackson, who caught four touchdown passes in the earlier Cowboy contest, has provided the big explosive scoring punch for the Rams. The key in the rebuilding of the Rams has been head coach Chuck Knox, who built a 12 and two season for their first conference title since 1969. Tom Landry's decision to stay with Cowboy signal caller Roger Staubach has paid off as Staubach led the NFC in passing while leading the Cowboys to the playoffs. The key to the game for the Cowboys was the silencing of the throwing arm of John Hadle, and from the onset, the Cowboys executed. Number 55, Leroy Jordan grabbed the pass in front of Ram tight end Bob Klein. Watch in an end zone replay, as Jordan's perfect timing lulled John Hadle into thinking Klein was open. Staubach used number 35, Calvin Hill, to move this one for 15 yards. Two plays later, Hill gave Dallas the lead. The Cowboy defense responded on the ensuing series, forcing Lawrence McCutcheon to cough up the ball, which number 20 Mel Renfro recovered. On two key third down situations, Staubach used timely scrambles to net big first downs while moving the Cowboys to the Ram four yard line. Number 12 then timed a perfect spiral to rookie Drew Pearson and a 14 to nothing advantage. Roger Staubach brought the Cowboys out looking to increase their lead, finding Gene Fugit for 38 yards. But Staubach quickly scuttled the comeback when he hung tough in the pocket and hit Pearson with a perfect pass between Steve Priest and Eddie McMillan. Staubach to Pearson was good for 83 yards, and as suddenly as the Rams had come back, just as suddenly were they knocked back out of the game. 
Drew Pearson, a free agent before the season and a third stringer for most of the year, had caught just two passes in the game, but both were for scores. Pearson's father had named his son after the famous columnist. And now in the biggest game of his career, Drew Pearson had written headlines of his own. Calvin Hill, dislocated elbow and all, had run downfield to congratulate Pearson, for all the Cowboys were confident of the doomsday defense's ability to jam the Ram offense for the remainder of the game. The Rams' last chance ended with a Hadel fumble recovered by Harvey Martin. The turnover led to a Tony Fritch field goal that brought the final score to 27-16 Dallas and extended the Cowboys' season for yet another game. Against the NFC Western champion Rams, Leroy Jordan made his presence felt when he intercepted a pass on the game's first play. Jordan's interception was converted into a Calvin Hill touchdown and Dallas was off and winging. Something new and something old combined in the next series as young Pat Tume stripped away a fumble and veteran Mel Renfro recovered. Under a state of siege, the Rams watched the Cowboys strike again as Roger Starbuck studied the defense and then struck rookie Drew Pearson dead in the hands for six more. A 17 to nothing lead in a reservoir of overconfidence finally burst when Los Angeles chipped away at the margin and in the fourth quarter trailed Dallas by only a point, 17 to 16. With it third and 14 from his 17 yard line and the game in the balance, Roger Starbuck threw up a pass and a prayer. Both were answered by Drew Pearson. <laughs> Dallas beat the Rams 27 to 16. And even though it lost to the Vikings a week later for the NFC Championship, the defeat did not dampen their achievements in 1973. The season, the Eastern Championship, and the playoff victory were tributes to a team that was written off by many before 1973 began. But the Dallas Cowboys hung together, and by the end of the year, this spirited team of young and old, rookies and veterans, marched to a 10-4 record. Maroon the Vikings at their own two-yard line. Three thrusts into the doomsday defense netted only three yards. And on fourth down, Mike Eyshide was forced to kick from deep in his own end zone. This time, Eyshide boomed the football 58 yards upfield. But this punt, like Eyshide's earlier 26-yarder, worked in favor of the Cowboys because Eyshide outkicked his coverage. And key blocks by Dave Edwards, Billy Joe Dupree, and Charlie Waters loosed Golden Richards up the sideline for a 63-yard whirl-away touchdown, which narrowed the Minnesota lead to 10-7. But as befits a team of championship medal, Dallas came scratching back. First Staubach connected with Billy Joe Dupree for 20 yards. And he found Walt Garrison for a tough 10 more. Robert Newhouse then rammed up the Viking middle for 19 more yards, carrying Dallas to the Minnesota 32-yard line. And though Dallas surely missed the services of their multi-skilled thousand-yard back Calvin Hill, a slow-motion repeat of Newhouse's run shows that they were compensating for his absence with second, third, 
and fourth efforts. Using Newhouse and number 23, Mike Montgomery, as talented substitutes for Calvin Hill's running and pass catching skills, Dallas penetrated to the Minnesota 17 yard line. But with third and nine, Roger Staubach scrambled and fell two yards short of a first down. And after a promising 10 play drive, Dallas had to settle for three points, making the score Minnesota 17, Dallas 10. A seemingly interminable five minutes at the end of it all left its frustration written across the bowed postures of the beaten Cowboys. 